Dear audience, welcome to the show, Power Chat. In today's episode, we are going to discuss about the democratic institutions support rendered from the international organizations. Joining me today is Mr. Carl Gershman. He is the president of National Endowment for Democracy, an institution based in the United States and supporting global institutions to strengthen the democratic processes uh, in different countries across the world. Please allow me to welcome him. Welcome to the show. Thank Mr. you very much. Gershman. Happy to be here. How have you been? I'm, I'm great and I'm, this is my first visit to Nepal and I'm enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, tell us, you are here uh, to facilitate some sessions, the civil society organization and the um, institutions here. Uh, tell us uh, about uh, your work with the organization you are leading known as uh, National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, your work and working modalities, would you briefly highlight your work? Yes, I will. Let me just say that I'm here uh, for a conference that is honoring the memory of Subhash Darnal who is a, a, a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy, a very good personal friend who was tragically killed in a car accident five years ago tomorrow. Uh, and this conference is giving the first Suvash Darnal Award. He was a Dalit uh, activist, a brilliant activist, and he was beloved by many, everyone who knew him, especially in the United States. The National Endowment for Democracy is an unusual organization. It was founded in 1983 as a private organization but there was an act of Congress passed in 1983 which uh, authorized funding for this. So it's a publicly funded organization, funded by the U.S. Congress, but which is private. Um, and our mission is to support democracy all over the world. We have institutes associated with our two political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, that work to support uh, democratic processes around do, the do world. Do you mean that uh, there is representatives from uh, the both parties? We have in institutes. We have institutes associated with both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, our democratic institute has an office, a headquar headquarters here in uh, Nepal, the National Democratic Institute, which works with political parties and members of parliament and others in training uh, parties and how to become effective institutions and really uh, communicate effectively with constituents. Mm -hmm. It's done on a nonpartisan basis. We also have a business institute associated with our Chamber of Commerce that works on understanding the market processes and they're active here too. And we have a trade union body as well. And then we support NGOs that work on human rights, free media, uh, civic education, um, all sorts of programs that are done by NGOs and human rights organizations. And we have an active grants program in Nepal working with groups that are uh, women's organizations, groups that focus on uh, Dalit rights, on uh, communication media, and so forth. Uh, so you mean that uh, you are working with a range of institutions globally, including that of the private and public, and then civil society organizations? We, we don't work with governmental institutions. We work entirely with private institutions. Mm -hmm. And those institutions are NGOs, but also with political parties, with trade unions, and with business associations. You mean the trade unions uh, associated with the political parties across the world? Not parties. These are independent trade yeah. unions that work to defend worker rights mm -hmm. and to ensure that workers have a voice in the uh, process of uh, development of economic policy and in international trade agreements and so forth. Your institution uh, founded um, decades back yes. in 1984 and it's been long. Uh, are you in a position to analyze uh, the achievements so far? Well, first of all, let me say that the, the world has changed enormously since we started our work in 1984. 1984 was the, it was both the tail end of the Cold War, but also the beginning of what was later called the third wave of democratization. It was a period of enormous democratic expansion, starting in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal in 1974 and 75, spreading to Latin America then spreading to Asia, Central Europe with the great uprisings of 1989 and then Africa. Um, and we've seen the world change and transform and our role has changed and transformed accordingly. In the beginning, we were mostly involved in Latin America but after the and Central Europe. And then after the revolutions of 1989, our, our work became global. We started working in the Middle East, our program in Africa expanded and our program in Asia expanded. And we're active all over Asia, not only in South Asia, but in East Asia and Southeast Asia as well. 
Um, and in the beginning, I would say that we thought that the progress of democracy would be inevitable, inexorable. Uh, we saw these great revolutions in the late 1980s, early 1990s during the third wave of democratization. Um, but after 9-11, and especially in the, in the last few years, after the growing um, assertiveness of countries like China and Russia and authoritarian countries, and we're seeing that democracy is no longer on the rise, quite the contrary, it's maybe in retreat. We debate whether democracy is in retreat. But it's a difficult period for democracy today, and we're, you know, we're staying through the, uh, we, we continue to support groups throughout this period. Um, Nepal is a country where, you know, it, it really was part of the third wave of democratization since the transition in the, Nepal started in 1990 uh, yes. when, when the, uh, you had a, a sec, uh, elected government come to power. Uh, you then, uh, you know, obviously it was a very difficult process of how to deal with democratic... Well, Mr. Gussman, I will come back to you about uh, the democratic institution and your support to Nepal. Uh, would you uh, also highlight about your support uh, in the global south, I mean the countries uh, in this region, including that of Nepal? Uh, what is your observation about the democratic institutions? Well, look, the largest country in the region is India. And India, has, uh, India is a country that has been democratic since the Second World War. Um, obviously, all democracies have problems, and India has problems, but because India is a democracy, we don't have an active grants program in For India. For India? Not, no. Um, we, we do support groups that work on Tibetan rights that are based in India, but we don't right now support programs in India. Mm -hmm. We have a large and growing program in Pakistan, because Pakistan is a country which is beset by um, a great deal of violence, um, intimidation. We support a lot of free media. We support groups working on education about democracy, civil society organizations, groups using communications media. Um, and we have a very substantial program in Pakistan. We have a smaller program in Nepal in um, working on issues of free media, and, um, and, we, and we can talk about that later. Um, and we have a, a substantial program in Sri Lanka, which has experienced a very nasty civil war, um, and where uh, the programs there deal with both uh, conflict resolution, uh, human rights, um, and rebuilding after the conflict, and, and the issues of transitional justice. Um, so, uh, and we have a smaller program in Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh is a, is a large country, there's a great deal of international assistance in Bangladesh, and we've only, um, our party institutes have been active with the parties in Bangladesh, but uh, the NET itself, through its direct small grants program, um, has, has had a, 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 only a modest program in Bangladesh. The, the issues that you raise, uh, including that of the human rights and um, the other democratic participation in the region, and uh, in the reconciliation and other processes. Uh, you also worked with the, uh, in the areas of human rights internationally, representing your uh, country, the United States. How do you observe uh, the capacity of uh, um, international communities, uh, especially the United Nations or other international community, uh, to support uh, national institutions in the areas of uh, promoting human rights? If you see in Nepal, uh, the impunity prevails. You said that you work with the media institutions. Your media institutions here are so vibrant. But uh, there is impunity uh, in general, uh, also in the issues of uh, when it comes to the media freedom. So how do you work with the organizations, especially with the civil society organizations, uh, supporting uh, to end impunity and um, strengthen uh, the process of democratization. Well, you started by asking about the United Nations, which is an intergovernmental organization, and its influence in promoting human rights is very, very limited um, because its governments are members and there are many governments that are not democratic that are mm -hmm. members and they try to block any progress on human rights within the United Nations. Our job is to support uh, groups that are working from the grassroots on human rights issues and on, on very much on the issue of impunity, so that where there is impunity, they will be fighting to, so that there is no impunity, that, that there is accountability. 
Uh, and these are the kind of groups we support in this region, um, but in literally 90 different countries, we support groups that are working on human rights. And it's a very, very difficult period because um, I think, you know, the dem democracy today is, is not doing well. There are authoritarian governments that are growing in their influence and their assertiveness. Um, they're trying to deny international assistance, going to independent organizations of human rights and independent media. Uh, they pass laws which restrict, uh, which restrict uh, in the, the work of independent uh, organizations uh, and, and their ability to get international assistance. So um, our job is to get the help to the people who are, who are working at the front lines of the struggle for democracy and human rights, and we do that. But it's not an easy job today. Um, for addressing impunity, the role of a state agency is equally important. But you said that uh, you are currently, or your programs are currently not uh, addressing uh, the state agencies. You know, here in Nepal, in general, there is impunity. Also in the region, if you observe, uh, there are so many cases of the human rights violations. And uh, civil society organizations, including that of the media, they always put this agenda in front. But uh, working along with the civil society organizations, that uh, may not sometimes work. How do you plan to work with the, with the state agencies, especially that of the judiciary? Or you the mean the government agencies? Yes, yes. Judiciary and the uh, security forces, you know, who are basically responsible for addressing the impunity, right. so to book the perpetrators of the grave human rights violations. Look, groups that we support can encourage dialogue between civil society and security forces, uh, but it's not our job to work with governmental institutions. There, there are international institutions that do that. And what the is the response during dialogues you engaged with the state agencies? Well, you'd have, uh, it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but mm -hmm. where it's possible to encourage discussion and dialogue, sometimes it's with local police forces, um, where governments are prepared to, you know, open up and have discussion and dialogue with, with sec security forces, that sometimes can be a very, very useful way, way to work. But, you know, often what the civil society organizations do is they try to raise issues of uh, human rights violations, and 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 they try to get both. I they try to get international attention for these issues. They try to bring them, uh, you know, before their own courts. Uh, they try to bring them before international bodies. Uh, one of the things that we do is also to um, promote. Um, we we issue alerts if people are in trouble. Um, so we try to work at the international end to raise the awareness of. Uh, international media uh, and international organizations about these problems. A lot of the groups work within the UN system to try to get the, the UN to adopt, uh, uh, to pr um, pass resolutions that create special rapporteurs on the issue, for example, of North Korea or other issues where uh, a country is engaged in severe human rights violations and the civil society organizations would like to see the UN Human Rights Council issue reports on these situations. There's a special rapporteur in Iran and they just uh, you know, approved a resolution uh, creating a special rapporteur for Iran. And we, w and we will support civil, civil society organizations to work to try to encourage uh, international institutions like the UN Human Rights Council to uh, be more effective and be more responsive to human rights concerns. Well, how difficult it is for you to work uh, in the countries where uh, the political system is basically authoritarian. At the beginning you said that it is tough to work it's there. Very Have you worked with the countries where the uh, political system is basically authoritarian? Yes. And how do uh, you work to plan in future? It's, look, it depends on, there. even when you mention authoritarian countries, there are degrees of authoritarian. So, for example, probably the most dictatorial country in the world is North Korea. Uh, and there we support Do a lot. Do you have the, your presence in North Korea or we don't countries have a presence. like that? We don't have a presence in North Korea, mm -hmm. but there are many organizations um, based in South Korea that work on promoting human rights in North Korea. Some of them are organizations of defectors, people who have been able to flee the country. Uh, they now live in South Korea, and these North Korean defector organizations work uh, to provide information to people inside North Korea, 
uh, to uh, provide information about what's going on in North Korea to the international community, um, and to try to, um, to try to do what they can to increase the communication between people in North Korea and people outside of North Korea. That's what can be done in that case. China is a, is, is a country which is a more open country than North Korea, but it is still a very harsh dictatorial country, and it's becoming more dictatorial. A lot of the groups work, uh, work from exile, and they use the internet and communications media very effectively to be able to, um, to try to in increase the access to information of people that exist within these, uh, within these countries. Um, you know, despite the fact that in a country like China that, um, you know, that it's a harsh, it's increasingly a harsh dictatorship today, there is a very vibrant civil society. China is trying to repress it and trying to prevent it from functioning, but it's been unable to crush it completely. And even the Chinese government frequently will uh, complain about the, 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 their fear of what they call colored revolutions. Colored revolutions are grassroots uprisings like Tiananmen Square mm -hmm. or like uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. That's why they're called colored revolutions. There was there are other revolutions and they're and so they're associated with different colors. China is very afraid of that, and that means that they don't feel that they have a secure hold on uh, the population. Um, and then you have other countries, Russia, where um, it's you know. It, they're trying to cut off the capacity of civil society organizations to function. They've passed harsh laws. Um, they, they've tried to cut off the capacity of civil society organizations to receive international assistance. But even in those situations, we remain active and we try to, we try to connect with the groups on the inside and to try to get them the help that they need. If, if they want the help, it's our obligation to get them the help that they need. Well, Mr. Gerson, uh, you have touched up on so many issues. Uh, Electoral democracy is one of the issues that your institution is working globally. And elections are uh, known to be uh, fundamental indicators of uh, strengthening democracy or a good democracy around the world. Uh, how do you work in the countries like uh, Nepal where elections, you know, there were few elections that of the Constituent Assembly, but uh, the local bodies are vacant there has not been election for about one and a half decades to the local bodies. How do you support the institutions here so that the civil society organization or other stakeholders, they put pressure upon the governments or stakeholders so that the individuals or the citizens of this country, like Nepal or other countries, they, uh, they are able to participate in the election so to strengthen the democracy? Well, I'm aware that there haven't been local elections since 1997. And I think that's terrible, but you know, this country had a civil war, um, and then it had a process where it was trying to agree upon a constitution, and that process dragged out. Um, and you know, until that process is finalized, it's, you're probably not going to have local elections. I think local elections are terribly important, and um, we will, you know, the, the civil society organizations that exist in this country, and Nepal does have a vibrant civil society, um, should demand um, local elections, but I think s before that can happen, there has to be a final agreement on the Constitution so that, all, so that there's a consensus on the Constitution. And you don't, I, from the discussions I've had with people in Nepal, you're not quite there yet. You're probably very, very close. And once, you know, you get a, a, you get a compromise agreement on any outstanding issues, um, related to um, federalism, uh, then I think there can be local elections and it, it'll be very, very important because unless you do have local elections, you're not going to have government accountability. You're going to have uh, powers that are very central here in Kathmandu, uh, but which do not have, are not accountable to people at the local level. And that's a very dangerous situation. That's the kind of a situation. What is the role of civil society? Uh, civil society is also vibrant here. Uh, to push the government agencies or the other stakeholders well, to hold elections in time. Yes, I, you know, I've talked to many people since I've been here about this issue. It's a very complicated issue, um, and my understanding of it is that um, there are s organizations representing a lot of the people at the bottom of the society, the, the Dalits, the uh, the Medeshis, um, and others uh, who 
still want to negotiate areas of the Constitution having to do with federalism. Um, and I think, I, I think it's very, very important to move ahead on local elections, but there has to be probably a final agreement on the Constitution um, you know, before, before that can happen. What is your experience working with other countries uh, since uh, elections to local bodies have not been held for so many years, almost one and a half decades? And there is a mechanism called political mechanism. All major political parties, they have a group, they have a mechanism in the local bodies, especially at the district level. And the resources that come to the district uh, is, uh, you know, in a way divided to the development works uh, when it is passed by all political parties. Does this mechanism work in other uh, fragile or transitional uh, countries? Can we learn or you can say? I, I think if, if what you're suggesting is the mechanism is where political parties distribute development resources, I think that's, that's very problematic. I mean, development resources should be distributed to promote development, not to promote the influence of political parties. And it can become a form of patronage, and you don't want that to happen. You want it, you, and so you need um, local, elected local bodies. And I think the situation here is very problematic uh, because you haven't had local elections, and you just have, you know, elections at the, uh, for national level leaders. And un un until you get the local, the local elections, the people are not really going to be able to hold the government accountable. And I think it's a very, very dangerous situation. Well, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, uh, about the situation of uh, you know marginalized and excluded groups uh, here in Nepal. You see, in the last few years, uh, Nepal has uh, presented with very good examples to all uh, politics, representing uh, women in the major uh, state agencies at the head, including that of the president. And also, uh, there are enough adequate discussions uh, among the groups to ensure their rights. But uh, still, there are some voices. And there are some discussions and debates going on that the state agencies or the government uh, institutions have not ensured the rights of marginalized people. And uh, uh, they are excluded from uh, the main streaming of be it the development or uh, the political opportunities. What is your uh, sayings about uh, the marginalization and exclusion in Nepal? Well, first of all, <coughs> Nepal given its size, is an extraordinarily diverse country. Um, it's not fully appreciated by people on the outside as to how diverse this is in terms of the numbers of different ethnic and caste and uh, linguistic groups. Um, so achieving sort of a unified sense of uh, national identity in a country like this is very, very difficult. And you do have a history of exclusion. Uh, of groups that have have not been uh, adequately represented, and these are these are caste groups, these are indigenous groups, these are Medeshi groups, and so forth. And women uh, are you know cut across all of these groups, and they are doubly um, discriminated against because women tend to be even in if, even in the excluded groups, they tend to be um, have lower economic status than the men. So you have a very, very serious problem there. And this is gonna, a great challenge uh, to Nepal as to how to deal with this problem. Um, I don't think the problem can be dealt with in the absence of democracy. Democracy doesn't solve the problem. Democracy makes it possible to engage the people in solving the problem. <coughs> and uh, you know the, the words that I've heard used very frequently here is the word inclusive democracy, um, equity. Uh, this is what this conference that I'm here for is focusing on, inclusive democracy. What does that mean? It means how do you include the people who are marginalized in the mainstream of the political and economic process? Uh, now that's a great challenge, but I think that's, you know, that's a historic challenge. And if I think Nepal addresses that challenge effectively, uh, Nepal will I think, you know, show, have a, a lot of lessons for the rest of the world. And I think Nepal can do that, but it cannot do it uh, without, without an open democratic process. And there, you know, you're going to have disagreements over how this process works. 
um, because some people will think, well, you know, everyone is represented, everyone is properly represented. If you raise issues of marginalization or you raise issues of caste, you're just going to divide the country and so forth. Um, it's going to require leadership and even statesmanship on the part of um, the, the political parties. Um, it's going to require on the part of the, the traditional elites in the society a more generous attitude toward the people who have been excluded and not just a desire to hang on to power. Um, it's going to be a, a process of, of competition. Well, well, Mr. Gussman, we are coming to the end of this show. There are a lot of issues to discuss. You at the beginning said that uh, uh, you also work with the media. And if we see in this region, you know, uh, media, despite being vibrant, there are a few, uh, in the recent years, there are some attack, targeted attacks against uh, media workers, especially uh, working in the areas of promoting free expression, be online or offline. How do uh, you address the issues of uh, violence against uh, media rights or free expression very quickly? This is an extraordinarily important and difficult problem where you have widespread violence against media all over, me, uh, journalists all over the world, in, in, in a country like Turkey, in a country like Iraq, and so forth. Um, there are many Russian journalists who have been murdered um, because it's very controversial when people, you know, investigative journalists report about corruption or they expose uh, crimes that people have committed. People, you know, there are people who want to, who don't, who object to that. So uh, you need, um, we support organizations uh, that defend media rights. We try to connect them with organizations like the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is a US-based organization which defends journalists around the world. Um, we try to, uh, we issue alerts and we do everything we can to protect journalists. Um, but it's a very, very dangerous um, profession. Uh, a good friend of ours was just uh, murdered in a car bombing in, in Ukraine, uh, a, Biel a journalist from Belarus. Um, and I, I think that it takes great courage to be a, a, a journalist in this world today, especially in countries that have high levels of corruption and where journalists try to expose um, abuses. And uh, I think it's necessary uh, for us to support these journalists and it's necessary for the international community uh, to uh, to defend them. Well, Mr. Gossman, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Good to see you. Dear audience, uh, time now to wrap up the show. Uh, keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste.